Folks, we're turning, please, to hymn numbered 539 on page 393 in our hymn books. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. 539, standing, please, as we sing. bow together please in prayer folks lift our hearts to the Lord seek his face and ask him for his blessing this day let's all pray <clears throat> gracious eternal loving heavenly father we bow in thy sacred presence this day this Sabbath day in the precious and lovely and peerless name of the Lord Jesus Christ O oh God, we thank Thee for who He is. We praise Thee for what He has done for us at the place called Calvary. Truly we can say today, Jesus paid it all. It's all to Him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain, but bless God, He washed it white as snow. And Thy people can stand in Thy presence, redeemed by precious blood, and saved by sovereign grace. Lord, we thank thee for the gathering together of the people of God for worship. How we thank God for the privilege, for the honor of addressing thee, of praising thy wondrous name, for all the Lord hath done for us. We never will cease to praise him. 
We thank thee for the person and work of our blessed Redeemer. And we praise thee, Lord, for being able to stand forth in this country of ours yet with liberty and freedom to proclaim to men and women the unsearchable riches of the Lord Jesus, for who he is, for what he has done. We never will cease to praise him. Lord, we come on behalf of the whole denomination just now. We pray for every brother that stands forth to preach in all of our churches in the world. We remember, Lord, faithful men proclaiming the gospel. We remember also our missionaries serving God in various places. Lord, we thank thee for them, for their lives given for the service of the Master. Oh, we thank thee, Lord, for the day that you called them forth from darkness into light and how you blessed them, even those in the mission field, those in foreign churches, those that are seeking to win the lost. We thank thee for every soul saved through the ministry and witness of our church. Lord, we pray in these days of darkness, of apostasy, of wickedness, it will please thee to breathe upon the work yet. O oh, revive us, Lord, how we need thee. We need thy power. We need the unction of God in our ministry and in our pews and in our pulpits. We cry to thee for blessing. Wilt thou not revive us again, O God, that thy people may rejoice in thee? We pray you'll bless this witness here in Kilkeel. We thank thee for it. Thank you, Lord, for the day you opened this witness up for the preaching of the word. We thank thee for the many years of the weeks of prayer that were held in January. And Lord, we do pray that you'll bless the witness yet. You'll supply them with a man of God to fill the pulpit. You'll encourage their hearts. Pray, Lord, you'd bless the members of session committee, the Sabbath school teachers, the children's workers. Whatever outreach work is done or planned, Lord, in all the work of God, we ask thee to undertake and to lay thy grace upon thy people. Let this church, Lord, shine as a light in a dark place. So come now and bless us here this morning. Lord, we need thee. We need thy help. The preacher is well aware of his own limitation. We cry to thee, Lord, to help us, to stand with us in this pulpit, move among your children in the pews, and glorify Jesus in our midst. In his name we pray. Amen. 548, another great hymn on page 397. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be his helpers? Other lives to bring. 548. We'll ask you to stand again, please, as we sing.
was good singing. At this stage of the service, we're going to ask our brother, please, to come and bring the necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, it's a joy to welcome each and every one who has joined with us even today in the house of the Lord in the various parts of the building. It's a joy to have you. We give you a very warm and very special word of welcome. We're delighted to have many visiting with us and we trust that you will feel much at home with us and know the Lord's blessing as we gather together in a moment or two around the word of the Lord. I'm sure you'll not mind if I give a special word of welcome to our brother Lyle and sister Heather Boyd. Uh, they have now retired after almost 36 years laboring for the Lord, even in the land of Spain. And it's a joy to have them back amongst us and we trust that the Lord will richly bless them even in their retirement. I'm sure we'll always, brother, find something for you and your wife to do amongst us. And we trust that you'll know the Lord's blessing as you come again amongst us from this Lord's day. Those who join us, we don't forget you even remotely in our various platforms. We're glad to welcome you too. And we also finally welcome our preacher, the Reverend Trevor Baxter. Our brother is one of our retired brethren, and we're delighted to have him today to minister God's word in this house. Some announcements to make us always subject to the will of the Lord. Do remember our gospel open air this afternoon at 3.30, and that will be at Master's Green in Bally Martin. The evening service is preceded by the 20 minutes of prayer from 6.30 this evening and then from 10 to 7 for 8 minutes we will have that time of hymn singing and then at 7 uh, our brother Baxter will be again amongst us to minister the word of the Lord in our gospel service. Tuesday at 8 the Reverend David Crane who is also one of our retired brethren, will be along to look after our prayer meeting and Bible study. And then Friday night at nine, do remember the men's late night of prayer. It was postponed from last Friday evening due to our school praise service, but it will take place on Friday evening. That brings us to the services of next Lord's Day at the usual times. Do you remember the early season of prayer at 9 a.m., 10.45, the Sunday school, the Bible class, and also the adult Bible class. We should say that next Lord's Day is uh, the last Sunday for our Sunday school Bible class and adult Bible class for this term. They will all resume again in the month of September, the first Sunday of September. The 4th of September is the date in the will of the Lord. Do you remember that, please? And the adult Bible class will be taken by the Reverend Brian Lorimer. And also remember that next Lord's Day is our children's Sunday when Mr. Lorimer will also be bringing the word at 12 noon and 7 p.m. Our boys and girls and our young people will be taking part. Do encourage family members and others to join with us even for that time. Our brother Lorimer labours for the Lord in our Clough Mills Free Presbyterian Church. The open air then next Lord's Day will be at 3.30 again and will be in our church car park and immediately following our open air we will have our sessions monthly season of prayer. Just some other matters to leave with you. Do you remember that all the offerings today including the returning offering are for the work of the Lord in our Christian day school. Do you remember next Saturday, the 25th of June, 
It marks not only the 16th anniversary of the opening of the new building there in Annalong Free Presbyterian Church, but it will also be the opening of the new church hall known as the upper room there in Annalong. Now that time commences with a barbecue at 5.30 p.m., and we've left a sheet of paper in the porch, and if you would like to attend that barbecue, could you please assist even our brethren in Annalong by noting down your name and the, and the numbers that plan to attend so that they can make sure there is sufficient food for all those who will be joining them for the barbecue. And then the official opening ceremony will be at 6.30 next Saturday, uh, and there will be the opportunity given to all who wish to do so to look around the hall. And then there will be the anniversary service, and that will commence at 7.30 p.m. when the preacher will be our moderator, the Reverend John Armstrong. Could we remind the members of session and committee of our forthcoming meeting on Monday the 4th of July. The session meeting will be at 7 p.m., whilst the committee meeting will be at 8.30 uh, p.m. Brethren, do please be thinking of those matters even for the agendas for those meetings. There is a parental consent form for those young people who are planning to attend the Youth Weekend this year. It's dated from the 9th to the 11th of September, and the cost is £30. They are on the table there as you leave uh, the services today. Please do take one and fill those in and return them, please, as soon as possible. And then finally... We do remind you of our Holiday Bible Club. That will be from the 8th to the 12th of August when Mr. Jonathan Storey will be uh, bringing messages on the miracles of Christ. Now, in connection with our Holiday Bible Club, uh, registration can commence from tomorrow and that will be on our Facebook page from tomorrow, from those wishing to register children and young people for that time. However, if you aren't on Facebook and you're not able to use this means, do please mention to us and we will get you uh, a written copy so that you can register your children for that time. Very much indeed. It's good to be back. It's a long while since I've been here. I was thinking of the weeks of prayer we used to have every January. And somehow, and I'm still trying to figure out how it came about, but I had the preach at the week of prayer three years in a row. And uh, it has lived with me as a, almost as a nightmare ever since. But I've been back since that, but it's lovely to be here. And it's lovely to be back in a church where I'm, I'm not preaching for a call. Praise the Lord for that. I wouldn't want to be doing that again. I was preaching in a church recently, just a few weeks ago. And after the service was over, people going out, a couple of ladies stopped at the side of the pulpit and said to me, would you consider a call? <laughs> I was a bit taken aback with that because they do have a minister already there. So you'd wonder what that meant. But anyway, of course, I said, not a chance. You need a hoist to get me in and out of the pulpit now. Uh, I've slowed down so much. But it's good to be here. I have to apologize to Brother Lyle because I, I, brother, I didn't recognize you in the prayer meeting. You see, like the rest of us, you're getting old. <laughs> At the Remembrance Day, we say they shall not grow old, but they do. And uh, there's been changes, and I know that. But I, I'm sorry about that. I apologize uh, for that. The last time I met you was in a, a, a mall in actually somewhere in Ulster. I can't remember where it was, but I remember it there. You had some young fella from Spain with you. Uh, 
That's right. He's agreeing with me, so he still remembers things. He's not altogether senile yet. But anyway, folks, it is good to be here, and I do trust that the Lord will bless us as we have this time of fellowship. And could I mention about tonight's meeting? We'd love to see you back again. We know the churches are, tend to fall away at night, a big lot. But you will know very soon that I don't keep you a long time. I always tell people this when I go to a church where I haven't been before or I haven't been for a long time. But I, I believe I was greatly blessed as a young man, as a student, and the, the training that we had. Uh, we had Dr. Paisley, of course, for church history. And we had Dr. Kearns for theology and S.B. Cook for homiletics and pastoral theology and Dr. Douglas, of course, for English Bible. And you couldn't have had better tuition from better individuals. But S.B. Cook used to tell us something. Every time the new year started, even if we were in third or fourth year, we still get this message. He said, man, there's something I want to tell you. If you can't say what you need to say in the pulpit in 30 minutes or so, that's because you can't say it at all. And I've always remembered that. I know there are some of our brethren that don't need to watch so much as a calendar in the pulpit, but I try to have the time right to let people out for their dinners. So you'll not be too long. So please come back tonight and may the Lord just undertake for us. I was going to have you sing maybe a couple of verses just to change your positions before we turn to the scriptures. Could we do that please with 557 on page 401? Just the first and last verses. When you feel weakest, dangers surround, subtle temptations, troubles abound. 557 verses 1 and 4 and we'll stand together please as we sing once again. Thank you. Joshua chapter 6, please. The sixth chapter of the book of Joshua. We commence at the verse, Mark 12, and read down to the end of the passage, please. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took, took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. 
But the rearward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp, so they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. The city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. To the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel accursed, and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. So the people went up into the city, every man straight before him. And they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. Both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in, and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire. And all that was therein, only the silver and the gold, and the vessels of brass and of iron, and put the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof on his firstborn, and on his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Amen. And God will bless his precious word to our hearts for Jesus' sake. A former professor of military science at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States said that the most exciting lecture he ever saw and heard was given by a guest lecturer in his class one day. The lecture was all about an ancient general's military ta tactics. The visiting speaker held the class spellbound for the entire hour as he talked about the strategy how he divided his forces and the campaigns to north and south. He described techniques of psychological warfare as well as elements of speed, surprise, and terror. At the halfway point, he stopped and he asked everyone in the audience if they knew who this great general was. Nobody knew. At the end of the class, some guessed that it was Alexander the Great. Some thought Napoleon. One person thought it was Julius Caesar. When they were all guessed out and had run out of steam, he gave them the name. He said, the military strategist that I'm talking about is none other than the Joshua of the Old Testament. He then went on to talk about the genius Joshua used in conquering Canaan. And true enough, his tactics were unique and wonderful. Of course, it all came from the Lord himself. It was the Lord that gave Joshua the ability and the skill and the talent to do it. It was God-inspired and led. And Joshua was an important part in that plan. Now, Jericho was an ancient city, some say the oldest city in the world. 
right in the middle of the valley that separated north and south. Joshua's strategy was simply to gain the bridgehead at Jericho, driving a wedge into the center of the land. The north and south were then both isolated, and the latter part of the book of Joshua is spent talking about the attack on the north and the south. It is a striking tribute to his God-given military genius. And friends, it was by adopting exactly the same strategy that General Allenby was successful in occupying Palestine in World War I. He adopted the same tactics as Joshua did in the main. Jericho's fall was essential in order for Israel to progress. It was the key. It was a real test for the people of God. The question was, would they obey? You see, the first thing it would do, it would test their obedience to the Lord. Chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 read, Ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once, and do it six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. Their obedience to that would test their obedience to God. It would also deepen the fear already touching the hearts of the Canaanites. For look what's said there in chapter 5 of the book and the verse 1. When the kings of the Ammonites, the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their hearts melted. Neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. Not only that, brethren, but when victory would come, altogether apart from military courage, it would convince God's people that the overthrow of Jericho was entirely a victory of faith. This is God's battle, God's victory. That's why the spoils of victory were to be consecrated to the Lord, as Joshua 6 and 19 reminds us. All the silver, gold, vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Yes, it was like the words of the psalmist in Psalm 115. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. Beloved in Christian conflict, the victory can be ours, but because the battle is the Lord's, all the glory and the praise and the honor must be to him. This cult of following men, no matter what they should do, where they should go, doesn't work. I know a friend of mine who's a very good preacher, not in this denomination, and a very good man, one of the best there is. And he left the church he was in, called to another church of the same denominational name, just a few miles away. Nearly half the congregation followed him. And that's a good testimony to the preacher's skill and ability of which he had an abundance. But it's not right. It's the Lord that we worship. It's the Lord that we serve. And that, friend, it's the Lord that must get all the glory and the praise. Bear that in mind as we come for a few moments, and it will be a few minutes, I promise you. Look at three things. First of all, look at the dilemma. The dilemma. Israel had to deal with Jericho. There was no getting away from it. It had to be taken. If it wasn't taken, the land wouldn't be taken. 
Maybe you've got a Jericho in your life. Something that you can't seem to conquer. Maybe some young person in the meeting has a problem and they can't beat it. Maybe some older person is the same. It might be something like cigarette smoke. It might be something like cocaine. I don't know. It might be something else. Whatever it is, it's a Jericho. And you'll go nowhere with God until it's overcome. You might think you're doing well. But are you? There's a very famous preacher. If I named him, you'd know who it is. But he had a very successful ministry for many years. This man was a soul winner. He met a young woman, fell in love. They married, had a family. And he went on in the work and did very well in the work. History could certainly write the word success over his whole ministry. But after many years, one night as he was sitting with his wife, just reminiscing, he said, dear, I have something to tell you. I want to confess something to you. When I was preparing to meet you or to marry you, the Lord called me to China. And out of love and devotion to you, I didn't go. And now I feel that all these years of service have been just my second best. And his wife looked at him in astonishment and she said, Listen, when we were planning our marriage, the Lord called me to China as well. And I said no because of my love for you. And they'd both been living good lives. Many ways consecrated. like They did a great work. But they felt that they had failed the Lord because it was second best. Can we sing in our hearts that we chorus, He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. Is that so? Well, you need to overcome the Jericho. For I'll tell you this, Canaan was safe if that city didn't fall. How could they take it? Well, Paul tells us in Hebrews 11, by faith, the walls of Jericho came down. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith. That's it. You see, they couldn't go back. They were asked to do something that seems incredulous. Just walk around the walls. Don't you think that would be a very dangerous thing to do? With these hordes of Jerichoites leaning over the walls? Would they not fire down on you? Would they not pour hot oil? Would they not do something? Not only once, but time and again for six days. Folks, I tell you, you need faith to do that. Don't you? And so do we to serve the Lord. Now they were also uh, ordered. Not only were they ordered, as in chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, but they were obedient. For remember this. These instructions came from Joshua. Who heard them from God himself. Nobody else heard the order. They obeyed the voice of Joshua the Lord's servant. As the voice of God himself. Wonderful testimony to this man's abilities. And then on the seventh day they were to walk. Thirteen times around the walls. Folks, it seems to be crazy to do such a thing as that. 
But we read there in the book of Isaiah, if I may turn to it for a moment, just a, a couple of verses. In Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. My thoughts, says the Lord, are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. Over in the New Testament, in the book of First uh, Corinthians it is. Book of First Corinthians chapter 1. Let me just turn to it for a moment. First Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm reading verse 26 through to 29. Here's what it says. Ye see your calling, brethren. Not many wise men, not many mighty, not many noble. But God hath chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And here's why. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Aren't you glad, friend? God doesn't look for great talent, but for great likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you happy that the Lord doesn't say, young man, young woman, give me your brains? If that were the case, there'd be a lot more of these pulpits empty than what there is at the minute. Not brains the Lord's looking for. Now, you can't be thick, to use the term in its right meaning. You have to have some wit about you. You have to have some intelligence. But you look at what God has called. Lady Huntington was thankful to God for one letter. That it didn't say, not any, but not many. She was one of, of course, high society and a godly woman she was too. No, the Lord just uses the common man. You would never have thought that Billy Bray would have been used of God the way he was in Cornwall. I remember him down that part of the world finding his, the church that he built. It's called the Three Eyes Chapel. He built it himself. There's three windows down one side of it. When we got there, I was fortunate that the place was open. I was able to stand in the pulpit and get my photograph taken and his photograph behind me on the wall. We read his life story. What a story. A man that was not one of the intellectuals of this world, but a man of God and truth. Before he went down the mine, he used to gather the men around him and he used to pray, Lord, if somebody's going to die down the mine today, let it be me, for I'm ready to go. These men aren't. That's the sort of man God uses. We searched for his house, or where he was born, a place called Twelve Heads. If you blink, you'd miss it. There's only about three houses in the whole place. But what, a, what an impact that man left for God. Now, of course, there are some giants. You think of John Calvin. Think of Luther, Knox. These men were theological geniuses. The top of the tree intellectually. Even the Apostle Paul. The greatest brain of his day. But remember. The twelve weren't all Paul. They were fishermen. Tax collectors. But God used them. The, question, the thing is. Beloved listen. The Lord can use you and me. In the church here. No matter what we are in society. And you don't have to be a young person full of vitality and fire. We all feel the getting old. I know that I can't stand for very long. I never would have missed the 12th of July. I couldn't go and stand and watch the parade right through. I couldn't do it. 30 minutes in the pulpit's about it. That's why I generally don't go to the door at the end of a meeting. But sit in the pulpit for a minute or two. But folks, you know, God can still use you. God used Caleb. He was 85, and you know what he did? 
He claimed the promise of God at that age that he was promised when he was 40. And all those years he trusted God. He pleaded the promise. He believed the promise. And when the time was right, he took it and claimed it. They were obedient. That number seven in passing is very prominent, of course, in the Bible generally. And here too, there are seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days. The number seven is written into the life of Israel. The Sabbath is celebrated on the Sabbath day of the week, seventh day of the week, seven weeks from Passover to Pentecost. The seventh year is a sabbatical year. After 49 years, seven times seven comes a year of Jubilee. Three of Israel's feasts fell in the seventh month. If you're ever doing a Bible quiz, young folk, you should ask this question. What are the three feasts in Israel that fall in the seventh month? The Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. TTA is a good mnemonic for you to think about and you'll remember. But sevens are very, very prominent. It represents completeness, perfection. The Hebrew word translated seven, the word Shiva, comes from a root that means to be full, to be satisfied. When God finished his work of creation, he rested on the seventh day and sanctified it. That would give the number seven its sacred significance. Seven speaks of completeness, perfection. God's plan for Jericho might have seemed foolish to men. But I tell you, it was perfect. Israel obeyed without questioning. Has the Lord ever asked you to do something that seems to your mind to be foolish, perhaps ridiculous? Well, it was in my case when God was pushing me into the ministry. For I fought that for seven years. You know, if I'd have gone when I first was exercised about going. I would have got away with just three years. I knew Hebrew and knew Greek. It would have been like paradise. But seven years and the Lord's through for them. Yes, sometimes you think you've been asked to do something ridiculous. Someone that never passed a school exam, I don't think of any value in his whole school life, had no interest in school. What a foolish young man I was. Oh, if you could live your life again. I would have been in university with God's help, but I was too stupid to think about it. Too unconcerned. Education is a vital thing, even today. How people think they can be educated without the Lord, that's more than I know. You have a Christian school connected with us. Thank God for that. That's a blessing. We grandchild goes there, pour it down. The other one will be going in September. I think it's September. And I'm thankful and I'm glad for that. And they were then overcomers. You know what they were told in verse 10? Don't speak. Now, ladies, you know that for a group of men gathered together, that's impossible. A man said to me once about a woman in our church in Dungannon, that woman, brother, she does enough talking for six rows of teeth. But you know, he was as bad. He was just as bad as she was. How do you keep, especially with all the pressure, the adrenaline would be pumping through your vein. When you think, keep silence. It's a hard thing to do. Ecclesiastes tells us there's a time to be silent. Usually if you're in an argument with a wife, it's a good time to be silent. But you can't do it, sure you can't. I know one man, he just says, brother, when we start arguing, I just walk out of the house and go away for a walk somewhere. And it seems to work. Maybe some of you couldn't do that. But we're told in the psalmist's words of Psalm 60, 46, be still. It's hard to be still. 
when you're anxious, wanting to get, go forward. But they preserved. They kept at it as verses 14 and 15 tell us. We may not read them, but they're there in chapter 6. Here's the lesson. Don't give up. Don't give up. There's victory to the overcomer. Robert Muffet, I have very little time left, but let me say this. Robert Muffet, Livingstone's father-in-law, was seven years in Africa, and he hadn't seen one convert. Not one. In those days, it took meal six times to get to Africa from home. It took it six months to get there. His home church wrote him a letter and said, how can we, what can we give you for Christmas six months ahead? Or even more than that for it. Had to come back. And here's what he wrote back. A communion set. Now he hadn't one convert, but he wanted a communion set. Six months later, at Christmas, it arrived. Did he use it? It was all used. Every single cup was used for a blessing broke out in that tribe of people and many were converted. That was his wall of Jericho. And by faith, he claimed those people for Christ and the wall fell. That's the dilemma, and I'm finished, but there's dedication here too. For the men they were up against were mighty men. We face a strong advocate, a strong foe, the devil himself. Well, the New Testament church, and I better close with this, the New Testament church had two weapons. We will give ourselves to prayer, and the ministry of the word. That's it. I was telling some of the young folk in Bible class this morning that Pastor Willie Mullen, who was a great favorite of mine, possibly the best preacher around at the time, so I certainly loved the man. But he was a bad man for a long time. But he came to do a mission in Ravenhill. Him and Dr. Paisley were great friends, always were, right to the end. And he said to the people, that a few weeks before, he had preached 16 times in a week. Now I've gone close to that, maybe 10 or 11, never 16. And he said, I would like to think that I spent twice as long praying as I did preaching. I have often thought about that. That to me seemed to just be absolutely incredible. But it's true. We need to pray. That's the only weapons the early church had. I have to leave it there, folks. It's all they needed, by the way. Could I ask you just to, in closing, sing a couple of verses of 464 that really sums up the theme, maybe. 464, page 363, simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way. We'll sing the first and last verses only, verses 1 and 4. We'll ask you please to stand as we sing. Thank you.
thank thee for thy goodness, thy goodness to the people of Israel so long ago, and your goodness to your church since time began. Lord, bless this dear people here in this house. May their hearts be stirred within them, all of us. May our love for Christ deepen. And Lord, grant that if there's one here not saved, that even you'd be pleased to speak to them. Bring them back tonight for the gospel service. And Lord, be pleased to be glorified in our midst. Separate us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll excuse me from going to the door, folks. If anybody did want to see us, we'll be in the pulpit for a time anyway. Thank you.